What is a work of art? That question is so subjective, yet I truly believe that my two guests have made it possible for us to drink every cocktail we have at the St. Regis Venice in a work of art. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time. My first guest is Facundo Gallegos, the bar manager at the St. Regis Venice. My second guest is Adriano Barango, the president of Barango Studio 1989 and Fondazione Barango. On my way to Venice last year, I happened to ask the bar manager of the Barclay Hotel in London what was the one bar I shouldn't miss. Without taking a breath, he said the St. Regis Venice. What made it so special, I asked, and he said, Facundo Gallegos. Adriano Barango, on the other hand, was introduced to me by a random encounter in a coffee shop in Canareggio. I was lucky enough to meet this cultural entrepreneur who established Barango Studio 30 years ago with the goal of restoring glass to its rightful place in the world of fine art. Just by chance, I discovered these two had collaborated on a project for the new arts bar at the St. Regis Venice. So, of course, I had to interview both of them. First up, we have Facundo with the story of how it all began. I'm Facundo Gallegos. I was born in Argentina almost 40 years ago. (laughs) I moved to Italy in 1990. So I spent pretty, pretty much all my life here, close to Venice. I started working uh, in the seaside, close to Venice, about 20 years ago. So I really start to enjoy this kind of this job, no, the hospitality job. So I start from the bottom, you know, in a very humble restaurant and pizzeria. But I understood that that was my my job for my life. So. After a little stop for the, um, because I, I did the military service in, in Italy, which, you know, I, I think it helped me a lot in terms of discipline as well. I came back and I started to work in, uh, in hotels, close to Venice as well. But my main goal was to, to do an experience in a, in a cruise line. So and my English was not very well, so it was not very good. And, but I make it. <laughs> And I did uh, one contract for the Real Caribbean back in 2007. So for me, I was 21 years old and it was my first travel, uh, you know, around the world and by myself. So it was a, a very tough experience, but something that really uh, helped me to grow. No, I think this experience they, they help you a lot. I was a bit scared, obviously, no, going that far uh, by myself. But at the same time, it was very exciting, no. So, you know, after a couple of months, I started to enjoy the, the cruise line and I really had a good time. I knew that that was my, my way, you know, the, the hospitality way. What were you doing on the cruise line? Were you making drinks, food, uh, a little bit of everything? On the cruise line, I was an assistant waiter, so I was working in the restaurant. They had a few restaurants in the cruise line, so we were working all departments, uh, in terms of restaurant and sometimes I was helping the bar as well so it's probably one of the places where uh, I start to see you know international drinks and food as well and most of it uh, is where I met a lot of people from all over the world no and uh, as well I met a lot of people either customer but as well colleagues no we were 70 different nationalities in the in the cruise line as well, there was a very high discipline, so it reminds me of my day on the military <laughs> service as well. So I was used to it. But I, I always had this focus to grow and to learn because that was my, my, my goal. No? So, but after that, I came back to Italy and uh, I, I keep working here close to Venice in a few, few hotels. But then I wanted more, and uh, if you live near Venice, the place to go to, you know, to work in a place where um, there is a better service, you need to go to Venice, no? So let's say if, if there is a five-star hotel outside Venice, in Venice probably is a three or four-star star hotel. So that's what, what we used to say, you know? So I had the 
So I start from something, and what I found was a, a restaurant close to, to San Mark Square, which is called Bistro de Venice, and I worked there for less than a year. So I start to understand a bit of the Venetian, you know, how to say, culture, but, you know, how is the life in Venice. And I was very lucky to enter after this experience to work uh, at the Cipriani Hotel. What was it like being at the Cipriani, such a famous hotel? For me, it was the first uh, time that I say a, a dream come true. It was very tough because I, in my mind in the beginning, before working at the Cipriani, it was, I had a different opinion of these hotels. No? My opinion and my thinking was like, was everything very calm, you know? But maybe that's what you feel uh, as a customer. But when I started working there, I understood uh, so far <laughs> what I learned. Yeah, it helped me a lot, but I had so much to learn. So it was very, very tough, but I was so happy to be there. I'm sure it must have been great training. I mean, incredible training for anything that you were going to do later in the hospitality industry. Absolutely. If what I am today, for sure, it's as well. I need to say thank you to the, to the team of the Cipriani. First of all, which is the, the bar manager. He's been there for 40 years. For 40 years. His assistant, which was called Ottavio, and the rest of the team, the, you know, I, I learned exactly what does it mean. Hospitality is the first time that I start to learn what really means hospitality in uh, the Cipriani. So, well, I met you through friends at the Blue Bar at the Barclay. And I then knew that you worked at the, the Connaught. You could have stayed at Cipriani for forever. Why did you decide then to come to London? As I said before, I was looking for uh, always to learn something more. The next step, uh, so after three years at the Cipriani, I realized that I want to learn more. I want to improve again my English and, and again to have a better understanding of what is the mixology, the, the cocktails. And for sure, my dream 10, 15 years ago was to go uh, to New York to work. I always, did. I had always this dream to, because I was reading, you know, in the, in the cocktail books, and for sure New York was one of the places. But London as well is another place, and for us uh, it was much easier to go to London. So the first step I did was to work at the Dorchester Hotel. So I spent six years at the bar at the Dorchester, where I can say I became a real bartender because I spent a long time there and it was a busy place and uh, it's where I started to learn about you know all the classic cocktails but um, what I liked the most was the um, all the, the books that I, I read before going to London were all cocktails that was very difficult to make here no like I don't know the martinez or many other drinks and in London I make it all you know because I think there is a culture in London, so uh, the people that live in London, they, they're still keeping alive these cocktails, you know, which maybe here that someone will order you a martinez or another classic cocktail. So, and as well, I found a place where all of my colleagues, they were very passionate about what they were doing. So starting from the bar manager, Giuliano Morandin, again, was a, a similar personality to Walter from the Cipriani. So... He's as well Italian. He went. He moved to London many years ago. Uh, he just now celebrates 40 years at the Dorchester, and I think he's the one of the best hosts I ever met in my life. So I think uh, again from the Cipriani, which I moved to the Dorchester, which is you know very similar, and it's real uh, true hospitality because uh, the Dorchester was born as a hotel right. itself, you know. But then, <laughs> after a few years. I was looking for something more and so I was very very lucky to start working at the Connaught bar with Agostino. Now now the difference obviously we're, we're talking hotel bars the whole time um, from the Dorchester to the Connaught what are those small things that you feel that you learned in making that step because some people would say that is kind of the same step one London hotel to another hotel what made the Connaught experience different? The Connaught is a smaller hotel than the Dorchester. It's a very cozy uh, place. You feel, you really feel at home 
in both bars in I think all the outlets when you when you enter the Connaught it's like enter a house I don't know how to, to explain maybe there are hotels that they don't give you that feeling but it's it's very warm when you enter there is this these beautiful stairs mm-hmm. apart from all of this I think the people that work at the Connaught they make the difference as I believe in hospitality this is the secret where most of the time a place is working so it's very popular or it's it's working properly so mm-hmm. uh, so I met a very again as the Dorchester team very passionate everybody was proud to work there and is a place where you know they really care about you your development your trainings um, so it's a, a magical place talking about the bars the Dorchester is a bit more classic uh, style, as Giuliano, you know, it's, he works since the 80s. Instead of the Connell Bar, Agostino, it's a younger gentleman, but very passionate about the mixology world. So he, he combined the, both things of the modern mixology to the beautiful uh, and flawless uh, service. So I think this is the one well, one of the secrets as well of the Connaught Bar. And, uh, and the team, the team uh, at the Connaught, it's a very young, motivated, and full of ideas. And the most important thing is that all those ideas, they take a consideration, and they, they transform into a cocktail, into something new. So it's a very old hotel, but again, it's uh, very looking forward to the, to the modern approach of cocktails, of, of food as well. So. But well, now we're sitting here in Venice at the St. Regis Arts Bar, which is very exciting. So I could imagine you, a lot of people never want to leave the Connaught because, as you say, it's such a dynamic place, forward thinking, plus the old heritage. What could draw you back to Venice again? Well, for sure, the first thing that I thought is the project that was behind this hotel, the St. Regis Venice. For me, Maybe a few years ago, thinking to come back to Venice was very difficult because if you think about the the mixology in Venice, you think always about the classic uh, cocktail, which I respect, uh, and those are the ones I I learned in the beginning, like uh, Bellini, and for sure all the drinks like spritzes. So thinking about come back to Venice and do Bellini, Rossini, was not very exciting for me after a few years in London. But I have this great opportunity again i was very lucky to be chosen as a bar manager here at the Regis venice and uh, the project behind was to to have something modern again a, a modern approach to the to the world so more contemporary obviously we we can keep doing all the classic cocktails but the concept here at the arts bar is to create cocktails very different you know so i would say on the same style that you can find in a beautiful hotel in London or a cocktail bar in, in London or any other uh, great city. So this is that I, I like the most. And for sure the hotel, the, um, the hotel is a beautiful hotel. We have a magnificent garden outside, a few terraces on the Grand Canal. So I think the address here, it's amazing. So So when you came over to work at the St. Regis and you had this great opportunity, um, what was the concept for the Arts Bar? Well, the concept of the Arts Bar, the name itself uh, reminds of artwork, was obviously to connect the the drinks to the artwork. But uh, the main thing of this, this bar is to become one of the special bar in Venice. Right. So I don't want to say I want to be the best because I, to be honest, I, I don't like to say that. I like to do what I know, and and then if it will be a good uh, result, I will be happy. So the idea of this bar is to have a, maybe a more late cocktail bar to find that feeling that you can find in the, you know, the great cities like London, like New York. So that's the meaning uh, of this bar. So it's a more late cocktail bar with a beautiful terrace in the Grand Canal where you can enjoy a, a cocktail even in the, in the winter with the heaters and still enjoying the, the view of this beautiful uh, <laughs> place where we are here in Venice. So this is the idea. And, uh, and as well to try to have a spirit list a bit more research 
a bit more high end as we we are the same ridges and we are looking for something more special. So how did you approach your first menu here? So our, uh, as the name say, Arts Bar, so each cocktail we try to represent a different artwork. Okay. So we've been uh, researching a few different artworks, possibly related to Venice, and obviously we thought about a menu which with a variety of ingredients uh, of spirits, you know. So we start to think uh, which uh, spirit could work well to represent that artwork. And that's where we start to, to think about this uh, connection with the artwork and try to represent the cocktail with ingredients and as well with the, with the glass. Now, there are a lot of artworks there. Where do you even start? Was it one that each person who works here thought, oh, this is my favorite work of art? How would you even begin to choose? Well, we do a bit of brainstorming and like, for example, we have the Guggenheim here. So which are the artwork now in the Guggenheim that we can represent in a cocktail? So we start from that thing and then the inspiration behind. For example, now we have a Negroni. It is by Salvador Dali artwork, which is called uh, The Bird of Liquid Desire. And you see three different elements on this artwork. So we thought already three elements could be a Negroni, no? And then we, we start to understand better what was the, the meaning of the artwork. So he was obsessed with William Tell, the, the apple. Again, this was represented by a loaf of bread. And one of the three pieces of the artwork uh, for the artist represent a violin. So we thought, okay, the violin's got four chords. So we did a, a mix of four different vermouths to recreate this kind of violin. So we connect the artwork with the... That's where we try to connect the ingredients. And, uh, but as well, we try to connect the ingredients with something related to Venice. So in this case, we use a, a vermouth which is made here in Venice. It's very difficult to find it. They don't give to everybody. So we, we feel lucky to have this. It's not bespoke, but it's a very special vermouth that we use. And this is one of the connections we, we try to do. And as well, the glass. And the glasses are so beautiful. So how did the collaboration of the different glasses to the different cocktails come about? So we create and we design all the glasses from the, the measures to the colors to the shape. Everything related to the drink we were serving and again to, to the idea of represent the artwork or try to represent the artwork, of course. So with a, a glass factory here in Murano, which is called Berengo, we've been working for a few months and we create these glasses with them, which we are very, very proud and, and happy to have worked with, uh, with them because the results is amazing and we have a lot of feedbacks that uh, they are very, you know, very good. Can you describe the the concept of that cocktail and how it fit with the concept of the glass and, or the reality of the glass that was made. Sure, so we thought about uh, Negroni, so uh, would be like an old-fashioned uh, style uh, glass. Uh, so we start from that base, uh, thinking about which kind of ice we were adding. So we have a big chunk of ice, so we measure the, the glass related to the, to the ice as well and then to the amount of liquid we want to insert. So this was the first step. So kind of a utilitarian first step. Absolutely, right. yeah. <laughs> and then uh, we try to recreate the colors that represent the, the, the artwork. Again, thinking about the liquid inside, which color can have and how will affect the color of the glass as well. So somebody who look at the glass will say, ah, this reminds me of this artwork that we, we explain to them, of, obviously, yeah. and so this is pretty much uh, the, the idea of creating our glasses. Well, I thank you so much for sitting down with me. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much. Now it's time to hear Adriano's story and how he came to be involved in this collaboration. The story started many years ago when I, you know, I graduated here at the University of Kafoskari 
in kind of contemporary literatures, nothing to do with glass. When I finish, I, I won a, a scholarship, a Fulbright scholarship, and I went over to America for this. I ended up on Long Island in Stony Brook, is one of the state university. At that time, because I follow a Jewish art critics, uh, Ian Cott, he was Polish one, fantastic. He wrote the best criticism about the Shakespearean tragedies, you know. At that time, I was involved in psychoanalysis also. I did, I did some courses in psychoanalysis. And I, and I took a course with Benjamin Nelson. He was the president of the Freudian Psychoanalytic Society of New York. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to get more into the practice rather than the theory, you know. So, but then I came back, you know. I, I started a career in America as a, as a kind of assistant professor at the University of Austin in Texas. And, um, uh, but then I had to come back, you know. And what to do in Venice for a poor guy like me? Because I come from a very um, simple family, from a very proletarian, they used to say, family. And, uh, and the, so uh, the only way for me was to, to go to teach. You know, teaching is a very difficult job, in my opinion. If I would be a teacher, if I would be a um, uh, man of the government, I would give teachers uh, the salary of a member of parliament because they have such a huge responsibility in bringing up a conscience. You know. So uh, when I was young, uh, I met uh, Peggy Guggenheim. Because I'm an old guy, so yeah. I, she was still alive at that time. And um, yeah, this was an incredible woman. You know, and I, I was very curious, you know, how she was doing with the art. Uh, although art was not my field, but Peggy was a very incredible lady. You know, when you when you meet her, when at first you wouldn't say she was a beauty, you know, but after five minutes she became beautiful. She had such a charisma, such a personality. She was a smart lady. So when I when I came back. I was teaching for uh, for some time at the San Giorgio Island, but then you know it's too 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 fatiguing, too difficult to teach, and and also I had the problem of uh, money because you know the payment of a teacher as was and as still is, I believe, uh, relatively low. So I, I I went to work in Murano by chance, you know, to see what was going on. But uh, after a while, I, I realized that you know to sell, to sell drinking glasses maybe to some um, a certain American family. The Americans are uh, compulsive buyers, I think. Yeah, yeah particularly you know the the old Murano. They they love the old Murano. Um, so I says, but what can you do? Or oh, more important than selling uh, uh, drinking glasses to American, you know. I'm nothing against drinking, by the way. Uh, or Americans. Or American. American. No, of course, I love American. Then. Yeah. So I, I, I realized that in the, in the 50s, Peggy Guggenheim, together with a gentleman called Costantini, she, she brought to Murano many of the artists of her entourage, in primis, uh, Max Ernst. Max Ernst was the second husband of Right, Peggy. of course, yeah. yeah. And so, and she, she got involved with glass. And I remember, I remember she said once that glass is far too important, the material, to be left only in the hand of the shopkeepers or the, or the glass masters. So it was very interesting. So I says, what can we do with glass? And then I started to, to continue that tradition. I started to get involved with the local artist, you know, developed to less, more regional Italian artist, and then I developed my network of international artists now. And next year we go to the MoMA of New York with Thomas Schutte, a German artist uh, with whom I've been collaborating. Yeah, yeah. So that is my background. I started to develop this uh, so I, I continue to produce glass, but not in the way that you, you would imagine the glass from Murano, you know, partly functional pieces, chandelier or drinking glasses 
or decorative pieces, you know, vases, yeah. So I completely focus on art. And do you work with all different artists to create your glass? Do I, you create any of it? Me, physical, yes. no, no. To, to make a stage is really important. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> to make a platform because, you know, it's so difficult. You always find, even now, very young artists. They all, they are curious, they want to jump into things, you know. It is difficult to find famous artists, you know, because then you get into another logic. You get into the logic of money. But the more I was advancing, the more I realized that um, even even famous artists are not are not so difficult to be to catch. Uh-huh. You know, so I we, it's, we and it's a special medium here. You know, glass is it's it's an incredible medium, a uh-huh. medium which which is largely still largely underevaluated for art. So, in fact, in fact, in America in particular, you have a, a very important movement. It's called Studio Glass. It's a movement which started about uh, 55 years ago. You know, uh, the, the, the head is Del Chihuly. Right, of course. I, I don't know if you heard about it. Of course, him, I, he's, I, love, I love his work. I love glass. The, the history in glass is very important. Mm. There is no future without past. So, and I, I have a special lichen of the history, but I'm doing something else. I try to, uh, like Peggy Guggenheim, because you see, when Peggy started the, the, the gallery, the art of this century, she said that um, I want to make a, a gallery, a hub, in which artists can be invited, but the, but the mission of my gallery will be fully achieved when my artists will think about the future, not about the past. And this is exactly what I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to see how art and how glass is going to, is being projected to. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the collaboration with the St. Regis and the new arts bar. I tell you, one day I was in my office there. I came an imposing man, a very tall man, you know. And he told me, I, je suis Monsieur Obadia. Oh, so Obadia. Didn't know her, but yeah. And then he says, I first of all, he says, I want to uh, extend um, the greeting to you, the greetings of my wife. I say, Your wife? I also don't know your wife. No, no, he says, You're for sure you don't know. But your wife, my wife, he said, uh, she, she never missed one of your shows. So can you imagine my ego you know, <laughs> going? Uh-huh. So I was very happy. And then he told me that he was the president of an investment fund, and he, uh, the fund has bought the Europa Regina. Yeah. So he says, I, I'm here to ask for your advice, because he says, you know, in the Europa Regina, I want to, uh, want the, 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 the atmosphere of Venice still remains, you know, but I also want that it goes contemporary. So he says exactly what you do, because you take a material which is 1,000 year old, old in Venice, because glass is older than 1,000 year. He goes back to the uh, Lebanese, the Phoenician, Syrian, yeah. And uh, and then by by having an artist to touch it, you make it contemporary. So, so, and then it was was a collaboration. And then in a way it was very generous because he offered the space for me you know we started to make some rooms the the Monet room you know the Monet suite there is the you know in this Europa Regina I have a book somewhere uh, I think the whole world went across yeah. you know you know Sigmund Freud yeah he used to go there uh, Monet from from the from, from the from the window of his room he could paint the right. San Giorgio Island, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jean Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Henry James, as I told you. Yeah, I think the, the whole humanity seemed to have gone to the Europa Regina. I was very proud to, to have the possibility of bringing uh, the, the, my art, my glass, in that context, you know. Yeah. Did you work with a specific one of your artists to create the glasses? Yes. And with yes. Uh, the head barman, Fukunda? 
No, I no, I, yeah, well, no, no. The, the Barma came came later, you know. Mm. But one one artist, for example, you see, we have the, um, a, an Italian artist called Riello. He had this great idea. He he took the books of literature, you know, the portrait of a lady, Emily Dickinson there, and so we burn the books and we encapsulate the ashes into a drinking glass. So each, each, each glass, it has a different shape, it becomes a kind of library, but this stays forever because glass is, yeah, it's a beautiful, in fact, I, I'm suggesting now there is not enough space in the hotel, I see. Maybe they should take a lot of furniture away, like <laughs> Le Corbusier, the famous architect, said that in Venice, he says, they should have the courage to throw out also building, which doesn't make any sense. But look, look at him. Look what he, uh, he threw out a lot of stuff. <laughs> he, threw yeah, out. he threw out the walls. Yeah, yeah so, there you go. So, uh -huh. anyway, so, and uh, then, then um, later on, I became familiar with the new general manager, Patricia Hofer. And uh, she's very active. She wants to market the hotels. And then she asked me to, to design some drinking glasses for the cocktail event. Yeah, it was a collaboration. Patricia of the Sand Regis asked me what, what I would think about the, having a collaboration for the drinking glasses, knowing that normally I work with artists, you know. But I said, uh, it would be good if it, it's... Uh, uh, you see, because also functional forms in design have to develop, you know. So, and so we had an appointment with the, um, I have an assistant here, she's an architect, Maria Pia, and she had a lot of talk with the barman, you know, and they came to a, to a definition of what could be uh, some drinking glasses. So we followed the advice. The, in the reality, the designer was the barman more than me because we behave like a, executors. Executor, how to say that? Yeah. yeah. So we made a, f a series of drinking glasses, and I think they like it because they could not present at the um, that moment, you know. And I'm very happy to have collaborated with this. I, I'm nothing against design, but. You know, I was focusing on contemporary art, but this year, exceptionally, we made a, um, a, a, an exhibition because of the Biennale of Architecture. Uh, we made an exhibition about uh, um, designers, you know, with new form, new idea, particularly focusing on illuminations, you know. So I think it's, uh, it was a great success. So I think that in the future we will develop, and I'm very glad that Patricia is giving me the opportunity to explore also this territory, which so far has been hidden, hidden. Yeah. I have to thank everyone who made this episode possible. From Raffaele Di Monaco, bar's manager at the Barclay Hotel in London, who introduced me to Facunda and to Venice-based storyteller Caroline Harth, who approached me at the Torrefazione Canareggio to introduce me to Adriano. Plus, of course, the two of them, Adriano and Facundo, for being on the program. We have Facundo to thank for our Cocktail of the Week. We are super lucky that thanks to the generosity of Facundo, we have the singular sensation that is the recipe for the Santa Maria, the St. Regis Venice's own take on the Bloody Mary as our cocktail of the week. It's a doozy, but hats off to those who try. You'll need these ingredients. 125 mils or 4.2 ounces of clarified tomato juice, 45 mils or 1.5 ounce of horseradish infused Absolute Elix vodka, 25 mils or 0.8 ounces of Verjus de Perigord, 3 drops of homemade salt solution, 3 drops of homemade spicy tincture, 100 grams of cayenne pepper, 50 grams of black pepper, and finally, Poli Grappa to spray on top. 
So you're going to throw this cocktail, which means pouring all the ingredients from one part of the shaker to the other a few times, and then straining it into a coupe glass. But first, let's get to how you make all that. First, the clarified tomato juice. Blend tomato juice with agar agar, let it rest for a half an hour, and then strain to get the clarified juice. Now, the horseradish infused vodka. Infuse a bottle of vodka with 100 grams of fresh horseradish chunks for two hours and then strain. Now the salt solution. Blend one teaspoon of sea salt into 100 mils or 3.3 ounces of still natural water. And finally, the spicy tincture. Infuse one liter or 33.8 ounces of vodka with 100 grams of cayenne pepper and 50 grams of black pepper for 48 hours and strain. Now after you've done all that, add all the ingredients to a shaker with ice and throw it four to five times. Then serve in a coupe glass with a crystal clear chunk of ice and then toast to yourself for making all of that. You'll find this recipe, more Bloody Mary recipes, and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com, where you'll find all the ingredients in our shop. Once more to Venice, and then I promise I am home for a while. Then all will be like clockwork. So if you live for Lush Life, make sure you head out to the bars and restaurants you love and tell them how much you love them. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly. Next up will be a history lesson from the City of London. Until that time, bottoms up.